Welcome to Scripting Big Changes with Small Risk. My name is Brad Sturkenberg, as it says on the screen. You can find me uh, via email at therealsturk at gmail.com, and I can also be found on Twitter at therealsturk. So uh, scripting big changes with small risk, uh, we're going to get into it. We'll talk about what it really means for our lives with PowerShell and other, other things that we're doing. Uh, but before we do that, I really quick, uh, I just want to let you all know that I'm super excited to be here. The, the concept that I'm sharing is one which is hugely helped me in my career, one which I think most of us, uh, in the back of our minds, like when we talk through this today, most of us are probably going, oh yeah, that makes total sense. Uh, but it's one of those things that if it goes unsaid, it oftentimes goes unthought. And I think it's really important that we, that we have this conversation because we, we need to keep some of these concepts in the forefront of our minds that we can really be more effective at the job that we're doing. Like I said, super excited to be here. I am going to jump into this thing. It is, uh, the session is more conceptual in nat nature. It's not a technical deep dive uh, like many of, the con uh, many of the sessions at the conference that you've been to. But let's go ahead and jump right in. So really quick about me. I've spent 15 years in, in the private sector doing IT consulting for mid, small to mid-sized nonprofits. Uh, about 10 years in the public sector doing everything from uh, large-scale operations and help desk, office automation, enterprise solution design, and IT strategy. I've worked with PowerShell since version 2. There's probably some people in this room that have been using it since it was just in Jeffrey's head. Uh, and, uh, but I'm, I'm not one of those people. What's that? No, 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 I can imagine. Uh, so I've been using it since version 2. and. I found it to be hugely helpful in my career. Uh, at first, it was it was one of those things that it was it was kind of scary, right? You're, you're taking away my GUI, you're taking away my checks, you're taking away a lot of things. And in the early versions, some of the niceties that we've come to uh, to love about PowerShell were not present, uh, and and so there was there was a lot of stuff that it was like, wow, all right, so I'm going to pull the trigger on this thing, and I have no real clue what I'm about to do, but I'm going to do it because I'm in the battle faction, right? And uh, and I just write my code, and it's ugly, and and I'm going to go. So uh, I've worked with Microsoft products primarily, PKI, Active Directory, that's my sweet spot. Uh, but I've also done some system administration and exchange and worked with the System Center suite of products as well. Uh, and in the last year and a half of my life, I, I, I spent in the CTO's office at the state of Michigan doing uh, strategy and, and, uh, and, and things uh, with, with the state of Michigan uh, across the entire IT portfolio. A little bit less time hands-on with PowerShell more time really trying to convince the organization leadership how we can do things better from an automation perspective. Enough about me, right? So this phrase right here, this phrase is what is the guiding mantra, I guess you could say, it's for this methodology. Uh, when we're good, we're good, but we are only human. We, we have a tendency when things are going well to believe that we are, we're good. We're just, it's good. I'm just going to keep going, just plugging away at my computer, making a bunch of changes, and and everything's great. And then and then something goes wrong. And that's when we that's when we realize that it's it's not enough to be good, because unless we're perfect, that doesn't carry us all the time. Uh, so th if you remember nothing else besides this phrase, when we're good, we're good, but we're only human. When you walk out the door, my guess is is that you'll remember the things that you need to remember that we're going to talk about today. It's not about removing risk. It's about reducing risk. For, for a long time in IT service provision, our managers have told us, hey, uh, you can do that thing that you say you need to do as long as you can do it with zero risk. But if there's going to be risk, then don't do that. right? And, and, and then what happens? We, we're crippled by this inability to accept risk. So I would propose that, that we, we can't be about removing it. We have to be about reducing it so that when we, when we fail, we can fail fast, we can p fail forward, and we can, we can fail into recovery. So I've got two scenarios that I want to talk to you about today. The first scenario is, uh, is a, about a fictitious phishing campaign. One of the, uh, if I, for anybody who was in Lee Holmes' session yesterday, uh, Lee talked about phishing being one of those things that's a, that's a critical thing that we're facing right now. Uh, and talked about how that's, that's playing into the overall landscape. But things have come a long way since uh, the advent of chain letters and uh, the initial phishing campaigns and things that, that we've received. I mean, I, I think by now, 
through the uh, Nigerian letter uh, fishing campaign stuff, I think we've given away about $53 trillion uh, in, in money, right? So, uh, but we've all seen it. We've all seen these things. It's, and it's not just about data. It's not just about the things that we know. In many cases, it's about the money that we have, right? These, these fishing campaigns are, are all about getting our money, getting our credit card information, getting our whatever. And occasionally we, we face a threat that's a little bit more sinister, a threat to, for some of us in, in the healthcare industry, for example, that threat is more sinister. It's a threat that, that is potentially against human life. It's a, a threat potentially against people's livelihood, people's health, people's well-being. So, so let's believe for a moment, let's make believe for a moment that we work for the same company. All of us work for a company called Hypothetical Inc. <laughs> and. And at Hypothetical Inc., we do many awesome things, uh, some of which are, are just extraordinary and, and world-renowned, and some of which nobody knows about. Because in most companies, that's the way it is. We have stuff that we do that everybody knows about, the stuff that's, that's public knowledge, and then we have the stuff, the R&D stuff, the cool stuff, the, the whatever stuff that we do that, that isn't so well-known. But here at Hypothetical Inc., we're all in, uh, in the war room right now because We've had a situation where, where we're being attacked by these fishers, and cybersecurity's alerted us to it. They've said, hey, we've got this problem. Uh, we need to get everybody together. We need to get the, the ops people. We need to get the, the dev people in the room. We need infrastructure people. We've all got to get together, and we've got to figure out how we're going to stop this threat. And we've got the director on the phone, and he's saying, hey, uh, get that done. But remember, you can't take any risk, because we can't have any downtime. We can't have anything fail. And so in this situation, uh, you guys have all faced, I, I asked before some of you came in, how many of you are, are exchange admins? Okay. How many of you have been exchange admins? Okay. So we're facing a risk, and that risk is, is multifaceted. Uh, that risk is one which is one which is going to vary slightly by organization. But, but let's talk about a few of the, the key impacts uh, that we may face. So, so people are spoofing our mail. They're saying, hey, I'm gonna send mail from you. I'm gonna send it to your trusted partners. I'm gonna send it to people who think it's coming from you. And this is one of the things that Lee Holmes was talking about in his session. You know, It's one thing when you receive a message from somebody that says, hey, click me. I'm this awesome message you should click and you don't know who the person is. It's a whole different ball game when that message comes from somebody who we know, somebody who we trust. So spoofing of mail from within the organization by bad actors is a, is a big risk for us. Likewise, capturing of credentials is a big risk because if they get our creds, what can they do? Everything. They can do whatever they want within our organization if they get our creds, especially depending on what creds we have. So that's a huge risk. And then one of the things, for those of you who have faced these situations, one of the biggest problems that we have in this situation is that they constantly change the game plan that the bad actors don't just do the same thing over and over and over again. No, they hit a wall, they change. They don't hit a wall, they change. They don't wanna change, they change. Why? Because they change so that we can't keep up with them. So we've got our security people in the room. Uh, how many of you work in security? Yep, so everybody in the, on the security side is going, we gotta find a kill chain, we gotta kill this thing, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, he said this, the saying in security is the hackers only have to be right once, and, but security has to be right every time. That's a very true statement. So security is, is sitting in the room, they're sweating bullets because the organization's at risk, and who's responsible for reducing the risk? Security, well we all are, but primarily security. So they're trying to figure out how are we gonna fix this problem? Let's kill mail relay. That's, that's a good idea, let's shut off mail relay at these points. Uh, anybody who's done mail administration knows that that's a really scary thought for the mail administrators. Uh, or, hey, here's an idea. Let's turn off POP and IMAP on every account. I, I don't know how many of you have organ in your organization have people who are doing uh, app, uh, app dev stuff and using POP and IMAP to connect to mail. Uh, it's, uh, it's a really disturbing practice, yet it happens. And, and so... It, Let's, let's try that, that sounds like a really good idea. Or, or hey, maybe we can unlicense things. That's a, that's a little bit less scary. So if you're using a, a, a cloud-based 
email service like we are here at Hypothetical Inc. Well, guess what? We just need to shut off the licenses in 0365 for everybody who doesn't need to send and receive emails. All simple stuff, no risk there at all, right? Yeah, right. So, so let's talk about that for a minute. So, so we said we're going to shut, uh, shut off mail relay at several key points, maybe at the edge of our cloud environment. That's, if you've had a cloud environment for any length of time and you didn't shut that off on day one, I promise you when you shut that off, it's going to have an impact. So, so that's not a really great thing for us. It's scary for us. Uh, likewise, turning off POP and IMAP for every account in the organization. We have no clue. Uh, Hypothetical Inc. has been around for 15 years. We have no clue why some of these accounts exist. I, I mean, the IT staff has changed 65 times over in 15 years. We don't, nobody's left that knows why some of this stuff is the way that it is. So, not to mention the fact that, as I said at the beginning, one of the biggest, one of the biggest struggles that we face in this, this whole process is this problem of the bad actors constantly changing their game. So even if, we, even if we take these steps, that doesn't mean it's going to stop the problem, and at least not entirely. So at this point, everybody in the room knows what, what you'd be thinking. We, we've talked about this scenario. We know what we'd be thinking. We've got customer-facing applications that could be broken. We've got internal stuff that could be broken. We've got a public image. It doesn't matter whether you're public sector or private sector. You have a public image, period. We all know that from Facebook, right? Uh, so it doesn't matter how well Facebook did what they did prior to the Cambridge Analytica thing. Uh, now all that anybody knows about Facebook is Cambridge Analytica. So we all have that concern about our public image. And, and we know that the change is going to take time. Anybody who deals in Active Directory or in Exchange knows that if I want to do a get CAS mailbox on a 50,000 mailbox environment and then do a set CAS mailbox on that same environment, it's going to take a little while. So. Likewise, in Active Directory, it takes a long time to, to parse through all the accounts in your directory. So, and, and let's go back to what our, our boss has said. Remember, we can't, we can't fail. We can't take any risks. We can't do anything that would break anything. Remember, when we're good, we're good. But we're only human. So no matter how well we plan for the changes, inevitably, we're going to make mistakes in our implementation path. And at this point, we have to change our game just a little bit, so that we can avoid extended outages. How do we do it? We do it through something I call inputs, outputs, and putbacks. You've all heard of inputs. You know what inputs are. Inputs are the things that we feed into a script or an automation process to make it more dynamic, to make it do the thing that we want it to do. Outputs are the end game of our scripting efforts. They're the thing that comes out of the script when we're done. And putbacks are the thing that you probably haven't ever heard of before because I just coined the term. Putbacks are the result of an output turned input. And the putback, I, so originally I was going to call the session inputs, outputs, and putbacks. And you would have not been here because you would have said, I have no clue what that means. So we made a change to a little bit more descriptive title. But really, the putback is the critical thing. It's the thing of beauty. It's the crux of the methodology. And and so at this point in our phishing story, uh, what would happen is, is I would have to turn to one of you and say, OK, we're going to need to make a change. So let's, let's, let's make that change, but let's script big changes with small risk. Of course, it's a shameless plug. I understand that. But it's, uh, it's important. So, so at every point in this process, uh, what am I really saying? At every point in this process, we may need to output something when we intend to affect a change. So at every point in the process where we intend to affect a change, I'm going to read it right off the screen because, because this is critical to understanding. At every point in the process where we need to make a change, we may need to prepare an output file, which can be easily fed back into the script to revert some or all of our changes. Think about that for just a minute. At every point in this process where we intend to affect a change, we may need to prepare an output file that can be fed back into the script to revert our changes. I'm guessing what you're thinking right now is, gee, Brad, that sounds like a lot of work. Sure, it does sound like a lot of work. It also sounds like it's going to be something, in some cases, monumental. Let, let's talk through it a bit. 
What, what's the problem? Oh, the wind. I, I apologize for that. Sorry. It, there's a. I'm fine right here, so I should just stand right here. Do you know why that is? I have a fan under there. You guys know my secret. So I'll stand over here. So I'll stand over here, and we'll be fine, all right? Is that good for everybody? I'm so glad that we are a room full of problem solvers, because you see, I'm sitting here going, what? What is taking place next to me here? <laughs> so you've all solved my you've all solved my concern of, of self consciousness that comes from not knowing what's going on in the room that I'm in. That's right. You've reduced my risk, and that's an important thing to do. All right. So I'm going to switch over here, and that thing is really high up, uh, which is fantastic for you guys. Uh, for me. <laughs> It's, uh, it's insanely high up, and I can't, just, I can't just point to things and say, hey, check that out. Well, that's a, an annoying feature of Windows right there. All right, so I'm going to step over here so that I can be out of the way and feel like I can point, because for some reason I want to point. So, so in this situation, right, we, we had our security folks tell us that they want us to make a change. They want us to turn off Pop and IMAP for every account that it's turned on for. We know that it's a risk. But we also know that we need to make the change because right now, what we're facing is a potential for security breach through capture of credentials, through a bunch of other things. So there's a number of different ways that we could do this. And in this particular case, we're connecting to our Exchange Online. And uh, we're going to just do a set CAS mailbox because some, someone in my exchange area already gave me a list of everybody who has their Pop and IMAP uh, access turned on on their accounts. So, so this is literally all that I have to do to turn it off. Super simple, right? Six lines of code. Everybody's happy. We've made the change. No problem. So oh, what happens when I turn that off? It's, that's, a, that's an honest question for anybody in the audience. Tell me what's going to happen when I turn off Pop and IMAP on accounts. OK. They're all going to be off. They're all going to be off. And what could it mean? It could mean that people don't have access. It could mean a number of different things, right? And that is a critical problem at some organizations. Email from a copier. Email from a copier not going. There's a lot of things. So, so, it, so in our war room here, we've just identified like 10 things, five to 10 things that could be a problem that we may need to address. So let's put this into practice a minute. Let's take a look at how this changes when we script big changes with small risk. So as I said, the key is the inputs, the outputs, and most importantly, the putbacks. So in this new version of the script, what you see happening is uh, we're doing a CAS mailbox. In this case, I'm not even relying on my exchange guys to get me the information in advance. I'm doing a get CAS mailbox against my environment for every account that either has pop enabled or IMAP enabled. I'm outputting the name and the setting for pop enabled and IMAP enabled for each of those accounts. Super simple stuff. We run through here. I, like I said, I output it to a CSV file. Everybody's happy because we know what those settings are. I'm going to run it through. I'm going to say for every one of those accounts, do exactly the same thing. Set it to false. Now, what's going to happen when the folks with the, the copier problem find the copier problem that I just created? What have I done by doing this? You need it turned back on. I need it turned back on. Well, OK, so your copier people know what the accounts that are impacted or are affected are. What if it's a line of business application that we have that is incredibly huge? Let's say our organization has one line of business app. Let's say it has 35 accounts that are associated with it. Let's say the guys who wrote it are gone. Let's say they don't even know what accounts are affected. Well, at Hypothetical Link, we have thousands of email accounts. And, and we just turned it off for, for thousands of people. And we don't know which ones to turn it back on for, for all the reasons that we've already stated. So you're right. I know what I impacted it by making my change now, just by outputting that file. and. The beauty of it, right? The beauty of it, I'm not going to unhighlight it, but the bottom line of code. Just take the second to last line of code and the bottom line of code, 
for a third of the last line of code. Comment that one out. Uncomment the bottom line of code, and guess what? We just put everything back the way it was. It's that simple in this case, and you're going, well, hey, but we didn't have a problem. Everything worked great. That was a colossal waste of time, Brad. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't. Why? Because at the end of the day, what's important? At the end of the day, what's important is that we went home. Right? We're not in the office still. <laughs> what's important is that at the end of the day, we went home. At the end of the day, the bosses were happy. At the end of the day, we got a little bit better at reducing risk so that the next time that we have a bigger risk, we're not going to be down and out forever. Oh. And we eliminated an attack vector. The security guy is telling me that we succeeded. We succeeded. So, all right. No way. It worked. Great. Awesome. So uh, PowerShell, it really works. It really does the job. So I had nothing to do with that, and, and, and it's a wonderful thing. So I'm going to move really quickly into our second second scenario here because we have, uh, we have quite a few steps that I'm going to take. This is going to be a little bit more interactive demo. So in this particular situation, uh, how many of you work in, a, in an environment where compliance matters? Okay, cool. How many of you are lying? Those of you that didn't raise their hand. That's great. I wish I worked in a place where compliance was irrelevant because it really makes life harder in some ways. And one of the ways that it can make life harder is when our folks from corporate compliance come to us and say, hey, you know how we've had those laptops and those desktops? Well, now we're going to have those tablets. We all go, why? Why does that matter? Well, because compliance. Uh, so, and we all know, those of us who deal with compliance issues, all know that's the answer, because compliance. Uh, in our organization, Hypothetical Inc., we have an IT policy that states that machines have to be named based upon the type. And we also do a lot of our, our billing and other site-specific stuff based on our Active Directory structure. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to jump over to that structure. We're going to take a look at it. If I'm unlucky, it's not still open. You know how the demo gods are. I, uh, th there was a couple people that had problems yesterday with the demo gods, I heard. Yeah, yeah, I was in that session. Uh, so, yeah. So, let's take a look here. By the way, really quick, I just want to give a shout out to Missy Januzko and Jason Helmick for their creation of Autolab. Autolab works really well for people who are trying to set up a, a really quick demo lab. This is uh, the, the single DC demo lab that I set up. Works great because right here, I have everything that I need uh, to be able to demonstrate to you how Active Directory is impacted by a massive change and how this process works for us. This is really uh, disturbing when you're not, just so you know, it's really disturbing when you can't see what's up there. Uh, so I mentioned our Active Directory structure is a little bit complex. So desktops and notebooks. Well, we have offices in many states. We have offices that, that contain staff who do a variety of different types of work. I'm going to key in on the notebooks OU for our Alabama office. And you can see we have marketing, sales, and support staff that exist in, in each of these offices that we have. Specifically, we have, and this doesn't matter right now, but it's going to matter. So I'm going to customize this and turn on some more information in AD. So we see we have four objects. There's four notebooks. As I said, we have a corporate compliance group that's saying, hey, you need to change a bunch of this stuff. So we're going to just script a change. No big deal. Let me jump into code. And we will, as soon as we get out of the remote desktop session. All right. So major Active Directory change that we're about to make. It's on a remote machine. We're going to go ahead and just connect to that remote machine. And we have an input list. 
we got that input list from our corporate compliance people. Actually, uh, it came from our SCCM people by way of a request from our corporate compliance people. And it, essentially, it identified all of the machine names for the machine objects that are now going to be considered tablets based on their model. So uh, that kind of gives you an idea of what we're doing. We're going to input that information. And as you know, if you're an AD administrator, you cannot create an object or move an object to an OU that does not exist. So we're going to go ahead and create that OU for, us, for ourselves. And it ran through. It did its thing. And I'm going to kick this off because I want to, I want to make the change here because it takes a couple minutes to run. And while it's running, we're going to talk about a few things. So it's running in the background. You guys can go ahead and let me know. You don't have to, though. I, I, I've got a plan to check on this thing at some point. Uh, how, so, so this change is a little bit different. In this change, uh, the first change was kind of just a simple flipping a, a switch. In this particular change, we're talking about creating a whole new OU structure. We're talking about creating, uh, moving a ton of objects, and we're talking about changing information about those objects. I understand that I did say in this scenario that our machine objects are named based on their type. Don't worry, we're not doing that now. We're going to use SCCM to push out a name change because it's a lot more friendly to the users when we can push that out and control the reboot. So I'm not going to do that here, and you don't have to feel like you need to come up and tell me afterwards that I failed to do that. Uh, it's in the plan. Uh, so, how, so this is different. This is a little bit more work that we're doing, a little bit more potential for problems. And any of you who are AD administrators, you probably have more than one of you at your organizations. Am I right? Yeah. So there's this wonderful thing where everybody does stuff, and they don't ever tell anybody that they're doing it. And that really leads to a whole lot of problems for us as we're going through these processes. Because when I make my change and I just move a bunch of objects from one OU to another, everything's good. It's not a problem. But what if you come after me and you move those objects to a whole different OU and you did it because you know that you need to make a change to every tablet and I did it because I knew that I needed to say they were tablets and then our SCCM guy comes back to us and he says, hey, hey man, so I'm really sorry. Uh, I used a percent sign instead of an asterisk, and or an asterisk instead of a percent sign in my collection query, and I accidentally got a whole lot more machines than I was supposed to. Right? That sounds sounds totally reasonable, and I'm not trying to dog on the SCCM folks. I, it happens to all of us because when we're good, we're good, but we're only human, right? So. Our folks gave us the information. They gave us the wrong information. And as we're preparing for this change to be completed, we're actually going to take a look at it. We're, I think it would be good to show you what we're doing here. So as I said, script is running, I hope. I, I really don't know at the moment that it is. Uh, it's an assumption on my part. It looks like things are going well. It looks like things are going well because we have a tablet to OU now. And we can actually see that there's 28 states that are identified there. And if we look at the state of Alabama in the marketing department, we can see that we moved one of our notebook objects over to that OU. So that's good. That's exactly what we were hoping to have happen. So let's jump back really quick. And we can see that our script is done running. As I said, we, we ran into a problem here because our SCCM folks came to us and said, hey, uh, and this happened, by the way, six days later. After you made your change, after I made my change, and now everything's changed to the point that I can't just rely upon where the object resides now in order to put it back in the correct OU. And so it, it's not just as simple, because in my script, my script is written with two prongs. It's not just as simple for me to say, well, I know that it's no longer a tablet type. Now it's a notebook type, so just make it a notebook again. That's not good enough, because you moved my object. Dang you, why did you move my object? So what I've done here, when we talk about how do we change our code so that we can script big changes with small risk, what I had to do here, if I scroll up in my code, is I had to have two sections in my code. One section where we do the work if we have a distinguished name. So if I know the distinguished name from, from where the object came from, then I can just input that and I can say, this is where I want the object to reside. 
If I don't have that and I only have what I had at the beginning, which I'm going to show you my files, my input files, because that'll help you to see what I'm talking about. If I only have, yeah, that BIOS name or, or a type, because in this case I needed to know either the type or the distinguished name. So when I did this thing with notebooks to tablets, I had a CSV file with name, distinguished name, and type. I didn't have a distinguished name for anything because all that the guy from SCCM said is, hey, here's your objects, and I just appended a comma, comma, ta tablets because I just wanted to move them from whatever the organizational unit structure they were in to the new organizational unit structure for tablets, which is a little bit different than what I did as I was running through the process. So as I was running through the process, again, outputs that may need to turn inputs are called putbacks. What I did assuming that I might need to put something back is I said, OK, let's be sure to grab the current distinguished name for every one of those objects that I'm going to move. Before I make my change, let's grab it so that we can, we can use it and go on. So I did that. And then, and then, as I said, my SCCM guy said, hey, Brad, I'm super sorry, but I really messed you up. I, uh, I gave you a bunch of stuff that you didn't need. And so I, I decided, because I was angry, that I was going to create this file called Crap We Shouldn't Have Changed. And I was going to put the crap back where the crap belonged. And, and so you can see this is just uh, a s slightly less voluminous version of the, the, the post changes that we made. So the stuff that, that was changed. We, we narrowed that list down. We got this list. And we're just going to run this list through exactly the same script. So we hop back. We come right up here. And of course, we have our file called crap we shouldn't have changed. And we're going to just input that file. And we don't need to recreate OUs because all that already took place. We're just going to run our exact same script again. And this time, it's going to take care of cleaning up the things that I don't need anymore because I never needed them in the first place, as well as moving the objects back to where they need to be. So <clears throat> I'm going to let that run uh, while I while I talk for just a couple minutes about some other things, uh, you guys don't need me to go back to AD and show you, show you the change that it actually happened. We believe, we believe that it happened because the first one happened, right? So let's jump back to our presentation. So wow, I am way back where I didn't mean to be. Hello. This is always good as well. Let's just keep going the wrong direction. <laughs> You're back in the fan. Oh, I'm back in the fan. I apologize, folks. So, so was it worth the effort? And the second time, was it worth the effort? We created a little bit more code. We, we have a, a, slightly, a slightly longer script, but we all agree it was worth it. it. It doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't have to be a lot of work. It doesn't have to take forever. What it does have to do is it has, to, it has to involve a change in the thought process. I'm in the battle faction. I just want to make the change. Boom, enter. Oh, crap. What happened? Oh, well. Boom, enter. Did I fix it? No. Boom. Nope, still didn't fix it. So, so that's my way of, of smashing and, and crashing through the china shop. But that doesn't work. It can't work as well as, as, as this process of scripting big changes with small risk. Because I am very human. Uh, you guys are, are all, you're just human, but I'm very human. I, I make a lot of mistakes. Jeffrey Snover even alluded to that. Nobody's perfect. Right? We're all fallible people. We make mistakes. And when we do, things like this can make a big difference. The first time that I had to use this, it, it actually was born out of necessity by me because I, I made a change to 6,000 objects. I work in a 50,000 object active directory at the time. And I made a change to 6,000 objects. And when the change was made, I didn't take any notes in the process. I just ran it. And sure, that's a real noob mistake. We all make those mistakes, though, don't we? We all make the mistake, whether it's five objects, whether it's 5,000 or 6,000 or 50,000 objects, we all make the mistakes. And we can all benefit from thinking a little bit in advance. Now. <coughs> Was it worth it? Yeah, it was worth it. What did I have to do to make it happen? I had to think about what I was doing. 
I had to think about what I might want to undo. I had to think about what the potential problems were that I, could, that I could experience. And I had to take all of that into consideration as I was developing the code. I had to do it before and during. Because in some cases, we're already done developing the code. And then this idea crosses our mind. It saves our lives, by the way, sometimes. This idea crosses our mind. Oh, man, what if that went wrong? Oh, that's not good. So you change your code a little bit more. You adapt to the problem that you might have, might have had. And, and again, I just outputted one file, one file that was created in that temp folder of all of the objects I changed. <coughs> this could get bigger. It doesn't have to be that small. We may be making 16 changes in a row. And if we're making 16 changes in a row, maybe I only care about the third, the seventh, and the 13th change. Maybe I care about all of them. Maybe I care about going back at any point in the process. Maybe I don't. There's a lot about this that raises questions. But like I said at the very beginning, it's necessary because when we're good, we're good. But we are only human. All right. Questions? Anyone? Really put back is just like a revert. Yeah. Put backs is just like a revert. The question was, a rollback plan, that's exactly right. So in our change, in our change control process, we, we have a back out plan that's required. Everybody in an organization that has that level of enterprise discipline has something like that. But how many of your organizations actually take that seriously and say, how am I going to get back to where I was? I'm seeing somebody not shake their head over here. Yeah. No, no, no. It'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. Right. Went right. back and forth. I even elevated it to his manager. Still didn't capture the data. Anyone here have used the roll back out of the change? So, so do you find it useful? The the, the idea, the, just even the reminder. It's just to serve as a reminder. When we make a big change, uh, and, and sometimes people ask me the question, uh, as I've talked with some of my peers about this, one of the questions that I've often got is, what's a big change? Well, that's really situational, isn't it? Uh, is it big because it has tremendous potential for business impact? Is it big because of the volume of change that I'm making? There's a lot of different things. The security guy's nodding his head. There's a lot of things that go into determining risk. How badly is your life going to be screwed up if it goes south? How late am I going to get home to see my family? <laughs> right, right. There's so many things. There's, there's so many things. Uh, any other questions? I, I could talk for a long time, so I don't want to keep talking. I, this is time for you guys to ask questions. After your subscribing budget. It took eight hours. <laughs> we ended up having to use PowerShell to access the dumpster in Active Directory to recover a bunch of stuff, and then use some more PowerShell to try and figure out what the heck changed in addition to that that I don't care about. In the end, it was bad because we rolled back the entire change. That's what we had to do. Oftentimes, that's what we have to do. That's not failing forward. That's failing backward. And we don't want to fail backward. It's not just because the release pipeline. It's not just because of this whole idea of the DevOps process and needing to be able to go, 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 go all the time. We don't want to fail back because we were already there. We didn't want to be there, so we went over here. Why do we, why, nobody wants to go back there, because that's not where we, we need to be. Other questions? Absolutely. Start transcript is another great, that's absolutely right. Uh, thank you. Start transcript is another great way for you to capture what you're doing. And it really comes down to, you saw that there were only three columns in the data that I output. Because there were only three things that I needed to get back to where I might want to be. Because at the outset, I determined all I might need to do is I might need to put them back where they came from. Because I didn't change anything else about the objects. So at the, at the start of the process, you have to determine, in some cases, start transcript 
and stop transcript are going to be enough for you to say, OK, I have everything I need to know in order to be able to undo something that I did. In other cases, where you're interacting with another system or multiple systems, what you may find is similar to me in this scenario. You need to be able to output information uh, that is specific to something that happened outside of the PowerShell script itself. Other questions? Yeah. So, <laughs> we call our case management process change prevention. Yeah, so, <laughs> so the question was, have you found that at any of the companies that you worked at that may have had a change management process, that that change management process made this better? Uh, I'm going to... I'm going to take some liberty in the interpretation of your question, and, and correct me if I'm wrong. You may even be asking, does, is it really necessary if you have proper change control in place? We have proper change control in place. Uh, at the organization I currently work for, we have about 54,000 employees. Those 54,000 employees use 60,000 computers, <coughs> and there are 3,000 of those people that are IT people. There are potentially 15 to 30 Active Directory administrators. There are potentially 30 SCCM administrators. There are, so in any given week, we have probably 285 change controls in the organization that we're reviewing. And there's local change boards and an enterprise change board, and all of that's great, and it works well, except when you don't read. And sometimes I just forget to read that. And when I forgot to read that, I didn't realize that the change they were making, they needed to take something else into consideration beyond what they described. So I don't think it, in our organization, the, where I work today at the state of Michigan, this has helped me even without, or even in the, in the presence of a very mature change control process. Because the maturity of your change control process is really only a, a thing if, if everybody adheres to it. It's a great process, but Johnny and the janitors, uh, sorry, in the, uh, the sanitation department, uh, he, he didn't you know, follow the change control process. And uh, so we went out to mop the floor. He spilled the water into my server, and everything was bad. Uh, stupid example, but it's, it's still little things, little things like that. Oh, we were making a change in this rack, and somebody thought our rack should be numbered number letter and letter number. So when I went to 10E instead of E10, and I powered off U34, <laughs> oops, right? Stuff happens. And when it happens, you just you don't know. Any other questions? I think we're, uh, I think we're almost out of time. Any other questions? If not, I'm going to be uh, hanging out outside. I appreciate it, everybody. Thank you so much for your time, and thank you for what you do.